Most folks, when they think about diet and nutrition, automatically folks related to weight. But food is so much more than that. I already just mentioned the impact that it can have on your cognitive performance. Food literally determines how your memory functions, period. Dude, you went from writing a book about sleeping to writing a book about eating. That's right, yeah. Why? So I'm a nutritionist, first of all. Like the sleep expertise came out of necessity, really. You know, I had folks coming into my clinical practice all the time, day after day after day. And, you know, we might get the very best nutrition protocol done, very best exercise protocol. But I found that if folks weren't sleeping adequately, they weren't getting the results everybody else was getting. So it was just a big gap in the market. And now it's just exploded. So that was back in like 2013. Mm -hmm. Now there's been all of these waves of books. I just did a, um, a talk for Tom Brady's company. Yeah. And they've got like sleep wellness coaches now. And they're using my language that I've embedded into culture. And they don't even know me. They, they've never heard of me, some of them. You First know? of all, is that a weird feeling? It's super weird. It right? is super weird. But that's the nature of any great idea. It's going to, it's going to spread. You know, it, traction. it's viral. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, it's a meme. It has this viral capacity. And so, but this is really my, I feel like I was born to write this book because as I'm looking at you, I'm seeing the food that you've eaten. It's mm. that powerful, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. It makes everything about us from our, from our eyes to the brain cell, you know, the dendrites, our axon terminals that allow us to have thoughts and feelings and emotions. It's all made from food. Our heart is made from food. Our, the tiny people hearing, the tiny bones in our ears that are vibrating and sending those electrical signals, it's made from food. Everything is made from food. And so this is one of the most powerful dynamic entities in our universe. And we get to choose what we make ourselves out of. And now what I really want to bring forth and eat smarter, because in our culture, and you know this, most folks when they think about diet and nutrition, automatically folks related to weight mm -hmm. in our culture. <clears throat> yeah. But food is so much more than that. I already just mentioned the impact that it can have on your cognitive performance. Food literally determines how your memory functions, period. And we'll talk about that today. Yeah. Which, which actually, when uh, this was two and a half years ago, my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. I reached out to you and you were like, dude, get her off of gluten. Uh, we got her on the Four Sigmatic mushrooms. Yeah, Lion's right? Mane, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Lion's Mane. And uh, a anyway, like, like so much of it has helped and it's, yeah. it's, it's food that controls every element. I, I think a combination of between food and sleep and hydration, yeah. like I, I believe like 98% of your ailments yeah. could be solved as a someone who's experienced it myself. That's it. These are called epigenetic controllers. So these are above genetic control. These are things that are determining what your genes are actually doing. The kind of copies that are getting print out and mm. printed out of you are determined by your environment and also the environment you create in yourself. And also even your thoughts have a big influence on your genetic yeah. outpicturing because, and that might sound a little bit woo woo, but every thought you have has correlating chemistry. By the way, all of it's made from food, but you can have a stressful, angry thought and it's going to create chemistry in your body that makes that everything kind of correspond. Sure. And we don't realize in our culture oftentimes that we have the ability to choose how we want to think. You know, most of the time our thoughts are fed to us. And so a big part of this is also being able to take your power back because the ability to manage that, that indoctrination, is to feel good. It's so much easier to choose how you want to think, to choose what you want to do in your life when you feel good. Not that you can't when you feel like shit, it's just harder. And the same thing, and some of the data in Eat Smarter, and my favorite, sec well, it's hard to say my favorite section, but talking about how food affects our ability to connect with other people. Yeah. And the data is just gonna knock people's socks off. Even our proclivity towards violence is, heavily influenced by our nutritional status. If we're deficient in certain things, our brain just doesn't work right. And we're going to have a bigger issue in being able to perspective take, to have patience, to have empathy, right? Oh, we, dude, we so, needed yeah. all of those things, patience, empathy, and perspective in this previous year. So here we are in 2021, we're January of 2021, ladies and gentlemen, and we saw what a sh over a year 2020 was and we lacked compassion we lacked empathy we lacked understanding we lacked kindness we lacked perspective and and you're absolutely right i mean this is, couldn't be more timely but um dude being a smarty pants that you are i'm gonna reel you back <laughs> for a moment i'm gonna reel you back and you said epigenetics yeah meaning these are the way you eat the thoughts that we have that we can control yep 
are beyond our genetics, right? Like someone might say, for example, uh, hey, heart disease runs in my family. Well, that's a genetic component. These are beyond, is that what epigenetics mean? Absolutely, and so even in this, in the, in the creation of this book, I consult with the, the very best people in the field. So the person who impressed epigenetics, that term into culture is Dr. Bruce Lipton. And so I just had a conversation with him the other day. And this is the, this is the top science. Everything else is below that. And a lot of our medical system is still largely based on Newtonian science, which is just these kind of, this thing causes this thing. Mm -hmm. And we're basically a victim to the cars that were dealt. But the truth is less than 1% of our diseases actually come from a true genetic defect. That's what I was gonna ask you is what percentage, so less than less 1%. Less than 1%, yeah. Yet what do we do as humans is we go, oh my God, I guess I'm predisposed to being fat, unhealthy, negative, victim-minded. Yeah. Really we succumb to the idea that <clears throat> almost 99% of it is just a byproduct of genetics or outside influence and I don't have much control. We could talk about that specific gene. I've talked about it a little bit in the book, the FTO gene, which is an obesity related gene. And the large number of people who never actually become obese, but yet have that gene, is just not getting activated in a sense. But one of the other big issues, and this goes hand in hand with epigenetics, and I think everybody should know this, is this new term I'm impressing upon culture called epicaloric control. All right, Explain epicaloric. That. So when I was in, in college in my nutritional science class, I was taught the very first day that if you can manage calories, you can manage your body composition. If you can manage calories, you can manage your health. Which they say calories in, calories out. And so my teacher was borderline obese, all right? He's a smart guy, but he was doing the thing he was teaching. He wasn't just like running out and, you know, just beer bonging, I don't know, sure. freaking Skittles. Milkshakes. Yeah. He, that was the food pyramid time. He was just like, I just need more fiber. I need more brown stuff, you know? And he was doing the thing to his detriment. And this is one of the big issues with, there's so many wonderful diet frameworks. And I know all the guys, we know all the guys, but each of them can be limiting because they might el eliminate a food that your ancestors have been eating for centuries. That might be feeding a specific strain of bacteria that's protecting you from autoimmunity. Mm. All right, or it's adding in something that's not right for you. And you're supposed to eat, you know, five avocados a day, but it's like, you know, giving you hemorrhoids or something. You right, know what I mean? Right, right, so right. So what it really boils down to is our metabolic uniqueness. And so epicaloric control, there's seven factors. I'll share two with you really quickly. One of them, and this is one of the most interesting things in Eat Smarter, is this was published in the journal Cell. They found a specific strain of bacteria that actually block your, intest your intestines from absorbing as many calories from your food, all right? Now, here's the thing. When, when allopathic medicine hears that, it's just like we need to bottle up whatever bacteria that is and sell it, sell it so people can continue eating and it'll stop them from absorbing as many calories. So explain this for dumb people like me. Allopathic medicine is what, like the pharmaceutical companies? Yeah, yeah like uh, conventional medicine, Got our, it. our conventional system of medicine, Got it. which is like a drug, you know, pharmaceutical model, yes. right? We find this thing, let's make a drug out of it. Yeah. And the problem with the system is that it sees humans in parts. Mm -hmm. This is why we have side effects, but they're really direct effects, right? We're trying to treat something for, you know, giving you a statin, trying to, trying to manipulate cholesterol in your body. Now we find out 30% increased incidence of diabetes when you get on a statin, Jeez. all right? Because our, the human body doesn't operate in a vacuum, right? And so when they, come out and they, get a, they give you the bacteria strain that blocks your intestine from absorbing as many calories that might also block your microbes from being able to produce B12 for you sure. or to protect your gastrointestinal tract because they're making these little scaphas, these short chain fatty acids to protect your gut. So here's the other side of this. So they find this bacteria and in my clinical practice, I could literally send out and have somebody get a stool sample done and I'll never even see the person. They could send the report back and I can tell based on the makeup of their microbes, whether or not they're obese, with about 80 to 90% accuracy. That's scary, dude. So now what we know today, and this is again above caloric control, there's a certain microbe makeup in our gut that's associated with insulin resistance, obesity, and here's what was cool. So they took, they found the strain in mice, right? But, you know, we're human, so what they did was they took uh, fecal samples from humans who had this microbe makeup associated with obesity and they implanted it into mice, lean mice. And then they took a healthy human uh, make microbiome sample and implanted it into lean mice. Those lean mice stayed lean. 
the mice who received the fecal sample from humans who have the, the gut microbiome associated with obesity, these mice became insulin resistant, they gained weight and gained body fat Holy simply gosh. by changing their microbes. So this isn't talked about when people, you know, well-meaning doctors are saying, just cut your calories. This is not addressing the real issue. Your microbes are determining whether or not you're absorbing calories and, and your rate of expenditure. And that's the second part, so I'll share this with you. This one's gonna be pretty simple for folks to understand. So this was published in the journal Food and Nutrition Research. The re and this is something we've been talking about for many years, but now we got the data. They want to find out what would happen at, for your rate of calorie burn when you eat a meal of processed foods versus a meal of whole foods. Okay. Even if the meals are the same amount same of calories. Same calories, got yeah. it. And so they had some folks that eat a whole food sandwich, all right? So they deemed this to be whole food. It was whole grain bread and cheddar cheese. All right, so that was one group of test subjects. They had another group to consume a meal of processed foods, right, a processed food sandwich. So this was white bread and cheese product. And if you're like, what is cheese product? That's Kraft, mm. all right? So they can't legally call it cheese because there's not enough cheese in the cheese. It's Kraft singles. Right, right. So they have folks consume, they're the same amount of calories, same amount of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. But here's what happened. The folks who ate the processed food sandwich had a 50% reduction in calorie burn after eating that sandwich versus the folks who ate the whole food sandwich. Holy smokes. What this processed food did was create what I call these hormonal clogs. It changed the way the metabolism was working, making their body more stingy and retaining that energy and holding on to it. It was gumming up the system. It was creating some kind of a a uh, hormonal clog, as I mentioned, but some kind of a of chaos, like a hormonal chaos. And is that a reaction to the fillers and the processing chemicals they put in, I guess, fake food, processed That's food? That's the key, it's fake. It's not even real food. And but we, is the body reacting to it? Like why, why yeah. by 50%, uh, there's a reduction of 50% caloric yeah. burn? This goes back to this epigenetic term. Our genes expect us to do certain things. We've evolved thousands, hundreds of thousands of years yeah. in this current state to eat real foods, to eat things that come somewhat close to nature. We can mm -hmm. cook, and cooking has created a massive, like a quantum leap in a, a, the development of the human brain. But when we start to get away from that, this is why even all that's happening in the world today, as soon as any mandates start happening that change what our genes expect us to do, I get a red flag that goes up. I know I have a cognitive bias. I have a bias towards like, what, is, what does our DNA expect from us? Yeah. What are things that we know to be true that humans need? We need sunlight, we need fresh air, we need community, we need real food. All of these things create our overall picture of health, potential health with our genes. When we take away community, when we take away exposure to sunlight, when we take away the ability to have movement practices, all of these things start to degrade our health rapidly. And one of the things that's not been talked about and this was in New York City. This was like ground zero for so much trauma that's taking place. There's about a 300% uh, increase in deaths from diabetes and heart disease that nobody's talking about. Nobody said a thing about it. And we now, since the beginning of this thing, as a culture, we are far sicker, far more susceptible. When you say this thing, are you talking about this COVID virus? Yeah. Yeah. So March of 2020, mm -hmm. am I hearing you say that there's a 300% increase just in New York City? Yeah, in, of, the, in the preceding months right <clears throat> after that, of deaths related to diabetes and heart disease specifically. Yeah, yeah no one's talking about too. it. The facts yeah. are out there because yeah. the numbers are out there, but yeah. no one's talking about it. Yeah, and so wow. again, why would we see such <coughs> big spikes in these other conditions? It's because we're moving away from the things that make us human. And also one of the things that I specifically talked about with, with Dr. Lipton, again, renowned cell biologist. Epigenetics is in our lexicon because of him. He shared with me the biology of fear. And I mentioned how every thought has correlating chemistry. We're just 24 seven fear. We're just tapped into it. Yeah. And one of the studies I actually just shared with the group today and how we get addicted to fear and addicted to stress. And we go looking for, it. we go onto the social media, looking for the thing that makes us feel something, you know, feel fear, feel like we've got a common enemy, right? And so we really have to, again, to take back control of our minds, we have to get our citizens healthier. Again, it, it's not that it's impossible, it's just harder if you don't feel well to control your own mind. Right. What, why, and I know this isn't nutrition related, but I respect you so much and having known you for so many years now, 
I'm asking for your opinion. I know I, I realize this isn't science. Um, why do you think it is that people have gotten so addicted to fear in this time? Because I know I can put myself in check. Like everyone else, I'm a human. I run a big fitness franchise, and all of a sudden my gyms across the world are being asked to shut down or have, depending on the state they're in, have limited capacity or zero capacity uh, open. Okay, now you're closed. And so I definitely get caught up in the fear cycle. Yep. But I also have a almost a self-check mechanism yeah. where I go, hey, dude, all right, now, now you're venturing in this place where you're going down the rabbit hole and this seems like it's gonna be bad for me, yeah. and I know how to back off. What is missing? What is going on with the people who don't have that, that they go down that rabbit hole, yeah. and they go into this darkness of depression, and the stay inside, and the fear-mongering, et cetera? Yeah, that's such a great question. So, uh, first and foremost, you have to understand our the evolution of the human brain itself. We're a little bit hardwired, not a little bit, but quite a bit hardwired to look for problems. All right, we have to stay on guard for things that threaten our life. Well, that's a survival of, mechanism. Yeah, sure. But we've we've evolved <clears throat> this highly complex prefrontal cortex that enables us to have like executive decision making, to distinguish between right and wrong, for social control. You know, things that we can actually see. Like, okay, is this threat a real threat? Is this actually going to hurt me? And nine times out of ten in our culture, it's it it's just. It's framing. It's not actually a threat. There's something that's going to hurt you. Framing. Explain that. That's beautiful. Beautiful. I love your mind. Framing. <laughs> so, and this is, I just shared this with the group today as well. You know, our, our system of media, it's got decades of data to find out what is the thing that's going to keep you glued to the station the longest. What can we do? And the number one driver that they use, a psychological trigger, is fear. That's fear. the thing that really connects you to the newscast. You know, something that makes you feel like your, your safety's in, uh, being threatened and also to have the, an enemy that you need to be on guard for. And if you watch a newscast, you will comp repeatedly see them framing things. There's something you need to, be, your, your, your safety is threatened and there's an enemy, all right? And they just do that for. over Oof. and over and over again. And so it's the framing, even if the threat isn't imminent, it's still going to be something that's because it keeps you tapped in. They're not gonna give you the good news report. My wife just driving over here, I was like, babe, can you check the numbers? 90 million confirmed cases. 90 million confirmed cases of COVID. 90 million confirmed cases of COVID. If you get any epidemiologist, and again, like I'll just bring on the top epidemiologist, have a conversation. Any epidemiologist, any epidemiologist worth their salt will tell you, when we have a confirmed amount of cases, at minimum, there's 10 to 15 times more of those cases in the population. So that takes us up over a billion, mm. over a billion. This is no longer pandemic, this is endemic. This is something that's just built into our culture. But you don't hear about the 99.99% of people, because once we do that, we just these are simple math that you do, who are okay. All you hear about is the threat. Not to say that the threat isn't real, not to say that, but what about the people who are okay? Did they survive? Sure. How did 900 million people, would you say at the low right. end? Well, what do we have, seven billion people on, on this planet, yeah. so, right? And so that's like one out of seven yeah. will have it. It's crazy. Yeah, and it most, 99.6 or 99.9% .9 will be just fine. Their own immune system that's designed to build antibodies and, yeah. and cure them. What, we're not talking about it at all. And again, this is not to say that there isn't a threat. Because that doesn't trigger fear. Yes. We don't have the good news report. Hey, we have all of these cases, mm -hmm. but it's cases without context. Yeah. All you're seeing is cases go up, but as the cases go up, that just puts the mortality rate down lower and lower, yeah. but it doesn't matter because of the, the, the framing of fear is already there. So again, if we can put it in context, what is the most important thing for us to do? What is the number one susceptibility to this virus and all viruses? Being healthy, healthy. being a healthy, resilient human being but the media will frame it up. Perfectly healthy people are dying too. I said this in the very beginning because I went and looked at the data in Italy and I was like, oh, we're in trouble because they saw the rate of chronic diseases and how that skyrockets your susceptibility. Sure enough, I'm not saying I'm Nostradamus, but the data was right there. The CDC published their study in September and anybody can go and look this up, compiled all the data and looked at all the deaths here in the United States. 94% of the folks, the souls that we lost in relationship to COVID, whether you agree with the, 
the, the, the, the tracking of the deaths, 94% of them had an average of 2.6 pre-existing chronic diseases. 94% so, of them. So am I hearing you say that even the, the, when they say he even healthy people are dying, right. you may look healthy. That's the 6% of the 94%. Not and they're just like, sure. those 94%. The media is going to frame the, the college student is 19 yeah. who's prop again, the yeah. definite, you and I, we can be as healthy as we want to be. But if we get stressed, we start, you know, we're taking a bunch of flights. We're not sleeping well. We're not getting the nutrition. You know, maybe we're just eating airplane food all the time, whatever. I've got data and we can talk about some of these things. Your immune system will be suppressed. Mm. We carry around with us. We have trillions, both of us, everybody here in this room, we have over 400 trillion viruses in and on our bodies right now. Mm. This is normal all the time. Many of them are opportunistic or pathogenic. They can make us sick or kill us. And it happens when our immune system is suppressed. Very Maybe. simple. I'm, I'm gonna make an observation. One, I understand why you're so frustrated. Like you understand so much. I don't know if you even remember this. You stood right there a few years ago and I was, we were talking, I had you on the show for Sleep Smarter and I was like, oh, well, it. I've got you here. I'm gonna be like, how can I optimize my health? Because if it's gonna help me with my health, it's gonna help I my audience, that, yeah. right? And one of the key things you said, I was like, dude, how much water do I need to drink? And you're like 30 ounces of water first thing in the morning. I think I was drinking like 15 at the time, or whatever this is, 16.9, this arrowhead. Dude, no joke, every single day, even like when I'm traveling in hotels, I just have 30 ounces of water that I just chug a lug and drink. Because I'm like, well, Sean is so neurotic about getting the facts and the information and not just kind of, you know, social media knowledge, but actual scientific knowledge. And so I imagine knowing what you know, not just the headline that the rest of us see on news media or social media, and yeah. what you know, your frustration level is yeah. high. Yeah. And I see that passion come out, like when you made the face mask, um, I guess it was a documentary, like a documentary really. is what it was, <laughs> yeah. right? It was like a 40 some yeah. odd minute, it yeah. seemed like documentary. Um, what what is your take? What what is and I'm not asking you to be political or you can be political, sure. but I'm not at, like why is this happening? Why didn't they use a virus two years ago, three years ago, four years ago? Like why this? Why right now? What have you heard from the people that you're connected to? Okay, so first thing I got it. You brought up the, <coughs> the the mass documentary just in case anybody's curious. I went in and looked at the data early on, but I'm looking at randomized controlled trials. So real world, like what happens in the real world? Many of the statistics people see, they see the cool like photography, but what they're missing out on, these are projective models. Those are theoretical models of how viruses might operate. What happens in the real world? So I went and looked at the randomized controlled trials and every one of them, every single one, people can go look one up uh, from the BMJ and it concluded masks are not effective. Cloth masks specifically were 13 times, folks who wore cloth masks versus surgical masks had 13 times higher rate of infection. Mm. Just right there, we should at least be like, well, maybe we don't want to wear a cloth mask, but that's missed on people because it doesn't fit with the narrative. I am curious to know why people who wear a cloth mask So what the, what the research has found, and again, anybody can go look this up or they can go to the modelhealthshow.com forward slash mask facts. And they've got, I've got all the studies there for you. You could just geek out, but I also frame them so you can understand them a little bit better. And so what the researchers concluded in the study was that the, 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 it creates basically, especially with the cloth mask, a wet microclimate. As time goes on, the more this is happening, just even within a few minutes, but especially folks are wearing them for hours a day, it's creating a vector of just nastiness. You know, it's, a, it's a, like a climate inside of your right. mask. Yeah. And so it's, it creates a, a, a lower resistance for part, uh, virus particles to travel in and out of the mask is what the researchers concluded. And so they advised against wearing cloth masks specifically, but even still, and by the way, so in the study they found that there's a 97% uh, penetration by virus particles through cloth masks, right? And it was 44% for surgical masks, which is not good. Yeah, that's still not good. If you're 44% yeah. penetrated, it still, it still counts, Pedro. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't so, need to be a rocket scientist to know that. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then what these pictures negate when you see the, the cool photography was like, clearly the mask stops the, if you could actually see the amount of viruses in the room, you couldn't see anything else but that. We're in it, we're absolutely immersed and inundated with viruses. And so what I was pointing to was not to say, I wanted them to be effective. I looked at the data trying to find what is the best method to go about. That's why I was looking into yeah. it. 
I wanted to make sure we do this in a way that's advantageous and not venture into the ridiculous. Because I saw my neighbor, you know, late 20s, early 30s, because of, he's tuning into the, the, this was 108 day, 108 degree day. He came outside full on gas mask, arms covered, long sleeve shirt, long pants, gloves on, just to walk from his door to his car. All right, so I want to make sure we don't venture into the ridiculous. We should just talk about this stuff because the data exists. I'm not trying, I don't want to be controversial. I just want to get everybody healthy. You know what I mean? But if the thing doesn't work, this is what the media has framed it. Our, our health policies, you know, our, the task force has framed it as just this preventative metric. If you use this piece of fabric, it's going to stop the spread. The thing that will stop the spread or stop sickness from it is getting our citizens healthier. But not once have you seen a major media not once have you seen a task force mm. member talk about the number one susceptibility. 94% of the people who died, 2.6 pre-existing chronic diseases. In the beginning, Bedros, when I would share this data, there were a couple of assholes that are just like, we saw, you're right, Sean, but unfortunately we can't get people healthier overnight. It's been almost a Yeah. Not one person has said anything about it because they never say anything about it. it they never cared about it. That's not how the system is made. Yeah. It's based on a pharmaceutical model that we're going to try to drug our way out of something, but it never works. Right now, here in America, every year, Pedro's every disease gets worse and worse. Heart disease keeps going up, diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's. Here in the United States, 200 million people are overweight or obese. Right now. It's a business, right? I mean, it's a, it's a business. It's, it's just, the reality is, <clears throat> it's a business. And at some point, you can, justify your way out of it by saying, well, look, people have a choice to get fat. They can choose to be lean. They just need to do the research. But the average person doesn't go out there and do the research. And if you are in the news media, there used to be a time the news media would share facts and not opinions and not misinformation. But at some point, if the lobbyists control the politicians and the politicians are putting out information that is designed to stimulate fear to sell more of the stuff the lobbyists sell might be the pharmaceutical company it might be the mass companies it might be whoever and of course the mouthpiece of all that is the mainstream news media like in that way the business makes sense because i'm a marketer i understand like yeah. okay, i'm gonna first i'm gonna drive leads and i'm gonna put you in a funnel that indoctrinates you and gets you to feel a certain way uh, that you are not making enough money and that your profit margins aren't high enough. And then I'm going to get you to know, like, and trust me. And it's easy to do that when you're seeing someone in your house on a screen of some sort, yeah. right? Television does that. It's like, oh, wow, you know, Walter Cronkite came into my house via this thing. But at some point, Walter Cronkite back in the day was not controlled by big pharmaceutical lobbyist or any other kind of lobbyist there. So I, I share all this because I see as a marketer, like, oh, they drive leads in the audience, they indoctrinate them through fear, right? And watch out, there's a common enemy. And they go, but here's what you ought to do. And what they do is once we begin to choose to lean into fear, instead of taking control of our lives, then we go, just tell me what to do. I don't know what to do anymore. And I remember, Sean, I took my son, Andrew, to the Chino Air Show when he was four years old. And he likes stuffed lions that have like the little wispy mane hair, yeah. you know? And he had this one particular one that he liked to carry around with him. And I happened to be holding it and he's looking at the fighter jets going by. And when a fighter jet is going by and it's got his afterburners on, literally the jet goes by in silence. And then like, like one second, two seconds, three seconds later, you hear the crack. Mm. sound travels a lot slower, right, yeah. than the speed of that jet. And so when the crash happened, Andrew panicked and, you know, he was just standing there just looking and then he, you hear the crash of that, the, uh, the, the sonic boom and he runs between my legs and goes into a panic and I just give him his little lion and he holds on to it and he gets calm again. And I see what's happened now is these masks have become the little fuzzy lions, the little security blankets that society can hold on. If I put on my mask, then I have this false sense of, Andrew wasn't any safer. If that, if yeah. that jet That's right. had munitions, it could have killed us, right? It, even if he's between daddy's legs, I can't stop a missile. But he believes that if I'm between daddy's legs and I'm holding my line, I'm safe. And he calmed down and he relaxed and he was just hanging out watching the jets go by. Yeah. And I thought of that now in this era, I'm like, holy crap. 
we create all this fear and then go, but if you just wear this piece of whatever, it doesn't even matter anymore. Across your mouth, you're gonna have some false sense of security about something you can't control when all the different elements you can't control, your sleep, your thoughts, the people you surround yourself with, your attitude, your mindset, your emotional discipline, your food. Your food, yeah. Your hydration. None of it matters. That, yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, man. That's such a great analogy. And by the way, again, just for everybody listening, this is not to be controversial. The, the data exists. I want everybody to be able to suspend their disbelief and just look at the data because there's gonna be conflicting stuff everywhere. And not to say that they can't be effective in some metric, you know, but at the end of the day, what's the most important thing? Yeah. And why is it not being talked about? Because again, the, our system has never really talked about it. And this, this is why a book like this, it came out, the first week it came out, became the, the number one <coughs> new release in America. Yeah. Which is crazy. Which by the way, let's, let's, let's uh, you know, you were just telling me right before the camera started rolling, the book was up there with Obama. Obama, Matthew McConaughey. And, right. But this isn't about celebrity, it's not about fanfare, it's not about politics, it's about health. Yeah. People do care about this, you know, but we have to, sometimes we don't realize, we're not, part of that frustration that you mentioned earlier, you know, I definitely, because I thought we were better than this. Yeah. In the beginning, I really did, I thought we were better than this. But we are, we just don't know it. And we really reverted back, even people that we know, colleagues, reverted back to that primitive, like, Everything is scary mm -hmm. and not really understanding how powerful we are. And all of a sudden they're listening to, just li quote, follow the science. Listen to the scientists. I'm a scientist, 20 years. I'm telling you there's another side of the story and that side is being censored. Mm. Now, we can actually take all the data and just have a rational conversation. When they make mandates about shutting down businesses, let's talk about the downstream effects of that. When we make mandates about shutting down our schools, let's have a conversation, let's bring in some experts and talk about what are the downstream effects of that? What is the psychological impact it's going to have on our children who need social interaction for the development of their brain? Thank you. Are they going to be permanently scarred? Are we raising a generation of Dexters because they don't know mm -hmm. how to relate and socialize with other human beings? And understand the parents aren't there 90% of the time, they can't turn their world upside down to now be a homeschooling teacher, right? So they're not, no, nobody in this chaos is being served. And talking with the top psychologists, psychiatrists, epidemiologists, everybody can agree, the top folks, the treatment for, for this issue is far likely going to be far worse than the issue itself. Yeah, 1,000%. You know, but here's the great thing. After all this, out of the doom and gloom, I love it, I love it th that this happened now, because again, I thought we were better than this, but I knew we weren't. I knew we weren't, but I was like lying to myself because we get into our bubbles, sure. where we're around healthy people. Right. We see this certain type of message. The great news is this, these systems that we've upheld as being of, of integrity are not. Our medical system that's being real, it's fluxed up right now. There's a lot of, of turbulence happening with it. Our medical system, again, anybody can go look this. If, if anything that I said today, go look this up and then let, go look at everything else. Take this study I'm about to share with you as the number one thing to start to have more trust in what I'm saying. Go to Dr. Google, look up Johns Hopkins, third leading cause of death, medical error. All right, look that up. The third leading cause of death in the United States every f***ing year. Number one is heart disease, number two is cancer, number three is death by doctor. Death from the healthcare system. Every year. And it's, just, it's as if it That's doesn't scary, exist. scary, bro. It's as if, and my argument is that it's really number one because of how poorly it treats number one and two. Right, All right, 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 right. So exactly. We have to understand that as a template from, now here's the good news again, that system is being shaken up now it might not be the way that we want it to look right now as far as being shaken up, but there's so many problems with it. When something becomes more malleable, it's easier to change. Before it was very rigid, mm -hmm. kind of firmly mm -hmm. in place. We've had more integrated physicians coming in, functional medicine, you know, but it's taking so long. Yeah. People keep dying. We needed this shaking of the snow globe to happen. And as you're saying, I'm glad it happened over a long period of time because like you, I was like, hey, I thought we were better than this. And again, it's because 
one, I lean into optimism. We lean into optimism, yeah. right? So it's like, I, I think humanity is better than this. And then two, you're right. We hang out in a bubble where people are healthy and optimistic and caught up on real facts and science and not necessarily fear. And so I was like, oh, shit, maybe we're not better than this. But enough time has gone by where people realize, wait a minute. They're telling me mask, no mask. Six feet, no feet. They're telling me go back to school, don't go to school, et cetera. Like, bro, I'm not a scientist. I just saw that when I, the first time I put the mask on to go into the grocery store, uh, maybe I'm a mouth breather, I don't know. But Sean, by the time I got out of the grocery store with my wife, and we spent maybe 15 minutes in there. Yeah. Bro, it was all like humid in here, right? I'm like, all right, something tells me if it's humid, stick. Who knows what kind of bacteria and germs and shit is sticking. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to do this. And so immediately the wife and I decided if our kids are going to have to go to school, because school was like, hey, they can come to school, but they're going to have to have the mask on all day long. I'm like, no, in 15 minutes, I had a goddamn Turkish bath going on right here. <laughs> there's no way, bro, there's no way my daughter or son are going to wear a mask for, for eight hours. hours. Yeah. yeah. Right? It's crazy. So yeah. I was like, all right, they're going to do the homeschool version of it. And that's that. And that's, but, but so many people are like, well, that's okay. And the reality is, look, we have someone at home that could watch, that could be there with our kids. We've got a full-time housekeeper and Marlon's a badass and she's like there and adults are there. All, most people don't have that. Right. So they're like, well, I'm gonna have to mask up my kid. And then when I hear stats like you're sharing, you know, and, and never mind what it's taken away from their immune system, that mask, what it's doing to their self-confidence. Like, bro, I'm a grown man and I can't tell when someone's got a mask on. Like, are they smiling at me? Do they understand what I just said? What is it doing to our communication? But anyway, all that said, this goes back to what we can control, which is what we're eating, yeah. our food. All right. And yeah. one of the sections that I really love most is section two. And I think that's selfishly because I want to know how I can optimize myself, my audience. How can they think better? How can they feel better? How can they control their mood, their energy, their metabolism? so that they can operate better because our audience on the empire show here knows one thing that money is a vehicle to meaning and <clears throat> i want to help them create more money so they can have meaning donate to the churches the causes the charities you want to donate to i want them to buy back their time and freedom and i want them to have a have an awesome experience with their family and money does buy us those things and so how do we operate better from section two like, what, how do we eat? What time should we eat? What do we eat? What are the things that we can do to optimize ourselves where eating is concerned? Perfect, perfect. So the most important thing, and for me, this is a habitual question I ask when I'm trying to identify a root issue or a root solution, like at, at its core, what is the thing? I ask, what is it made of? Where did it come from, right? So in talking about cognitive performance, this has to do with our brains and, uh, 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 theoretical physicist Michio Kaku said that the human brain is the most powerful entity in the known universe. All right. It is powerful beyond measure. It created everything that we see here in this room. Sure. Right. It's so, so remarkable, but we don't get an owner's manual, you know, largely we don't know anything about it. And there's this thing in, it's really out of the world of personal development. We only use like 5% of our brain, 10%. It's not like there's parts of your brain that are just like sitting on time out. They're just like, I'm not playing with you guys. Our whole brain works all the time. We just don't use it very well. There's so much more potential for our brains. And so to be able to be more productive, to have a better memory, to be able to focus during, mm. especially when you're under stress and, and distraction at this time in human history, we've got data on how we can do that. So first question is, what is your brain made of? Number one answer is made of water. So when you mention your, your water routine, your inner bath you take every day. Mm -hmm. Inner bath, I love that. Yeah, the first thing, and just to give a little metabolic side for folks, and what, this is one of the great studies that's in Eat Smarter, there's something called water-induced thermogenesis. So what the researchers did was have folks who just consumed 17 ounces of water in just a couple of minutes, and it led to a dramatic increase in their metabolism. And we might think, try to mansplain it, well, it's the, water, the body's heating the water up, but it, no, it just makes everything work better. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter the temperature of the water. And what they found was that the folks, their metabolic rate went up to the degree that they, they burned about 25 to 50 more calories simply from drinking water. So you're drinking something with no calories and it makes you burn calories. Hmm. And now in our culture, some is good, more is better. So it's just like, well, I should just drink, you know, right. three right. gallons. Right. There, there are diminishing returns, right? Because there's a level, there's your extracellular fluid and the cells themselves. And I talk about hydration a lot in the book, but here's why this matters for the brain. One of the studies found that just a 2% drop 
and the test subject's optimal kind of baseline hydration level led to uh, decreased reaction time, decreased ability to focus, decreased spatial recognition. So like being able to manage yourself in space, mm -hmm. like map rep recognition. So basically you become dumber. All right, you become more of like the Lloyd Christmas and version just of yourself. Two, <laughs> and that's just 2% decrease. That's it. that's it, it doesn't take much. You know, that's so a, that's a small amount. That's a small, that's a pretty small amount. But most folks are walking around and like a, their baseline is like right under dehydrated, you know. And so simply by getting and by they, they reverse the issue by getting them hydrated. So what does that look like? Um, I go I go through and give a big kind of uh, dissertation on water in a way that's fun, in a way that makes sense. There's so many different little nuances with it, but and I don't really like to give specifics at all. Like that's, that's not what you're gonna find in the book, eat this thing, don't eat that. I'm gonna right. tell you what the data shows, but everybody is unique. You need a different amount of water than Shaq. You know what I mean? You need a different amount of water than Simone Biles. This cookie cutter of like drink eight ounces, eight glasses of eight ounces a day, whatever. But I do give a baseline of like, take your body weight, divide it in half. That number you come up with, target that amount of ounces. But even that I don't like to do because the number one metric on how much water you should drink is your brain and your body telling you. Right. But we're so externally focused, <laughs> we, we're not getting that data. And that has to do with your hypothalamus. And you know, we, maybe we could circle back to this. But so number one is water. But number two, and this, is, this goes hand in hand with the water. So it's very important what I'm about to say. Electrolytes, mm. all right? Listen, dude, one of the craziest studies was on the impact of sodium in the brain. So electrolytes literally are needed to make the electrical impulses in the brain for your brain cells to talk. It matters. We know about electrolytes from Gatorade, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. But this is literally talking about your brain being able to talk to its, your brain cells being able to talk to themselves. So they found that uh, deficiency in sodium led to decreased cognitive performance. So getting adequate amounts of sodium, but the real game changer was magnesium, which is another electrolyte. And so one of the studies found that uh, folks with already uh, documented cognitive decline, right? So they're, on their, they're in their 50s to, I believe, 50s and 70s. They already have cognitive decline taking place. By increasing their intake of magnesium, after the study was complete, they found that the folks who got their, their magnesium levels optimized had brains that were operating as if they were nine years younger. Holy crap. When A we talk decade about, of youth. Dude, when we talk about issues like dementia, Alzheimer's, in conventional medicine today, it's just all you can do is try to slow it down. There's nothing about making it better. The data exists. Your, your body, magnesium is responsible for over 625 biochemical processes in your body. That means there's 625 things your body can't do hmm. if you're deficient in it. All right, selfish question. Um, I take magnesium at night, uh, 400, I think it's milligrams to go to, you know, just to help with going into deeper sleep. Do I need to spread my magnesium out throughout the day in addition to what I take at night? Or does my body know, all right, I got that, I'm gonna spread it out? That's a great question. So. This, this is, is why I love having you yeah. here. I love having the smart people on the show because I can just selfishly ask all the right questions and help everybody. This is what Eat Smarter is all about, man, is looking at the bigger picture. There's so, when I was in my nutritional science class in college, we were taught, you know, make sure you get your essential vitamins and minerals, right. and amino acids, but you can get, get, just get a multivitamin. There's so many different types of magnesium. There's not just one. The multivitamin has one. Is that the one that you need? Mm. There's different types of vitamin C. There's different types of omega-3s. There's different types of B12. There's different types of everything. Food has it all. That's what makes food so remarkable. And it has biopotentiators and cofactors that come along with it that make your body be able to use it better. Circles right back so, to whole food. So that's the number one tenet is when we're talking about magnesium, we want to make sure we're getting in a variety of high quality food sources. But what I want folks to realize is that because it's responsible for so much, it really has a lot to do with modulating stress in the body, modulating your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, and modulating you know, your muscle contractions. And so with all that said, modulating your nervous system, what's our life like today? How's our nervous system doing? Sure. We're stressed the f yeah. So it's getting just burned through. 
Your body is using so much of it. This is why it is the number one mineral deficiency in our country. Documented in the book, about 60% of people are chronically deficient in magnesium. Mm. Based off of the best studies that we have. So this is not something to take lightly or joke about. So folks are, this kind of impact on our cognitive performance, folks are walking around and their brains are not working right. Wondering why we're so pissed off. Wondering why we're so irritated when just having a conversation about maths. Let's talk about it. Mm. Nah, I can't. Can't. You know, can't. so number one, food first. What are some good food sources? Anything that's green. This is another thing we talk about in the book as well. These powerful clues that is just provided in nature. And there's a science, we, we also go to the science of flavor, right? So I'll circle back to that in one second. It's really cool. But these, the green pigment is an indicator that it's high magnesium food. And coincidentally, a study from Rush University Medical Center found that the test subjects who consumed at least two servings of green leafy vegetables each day had on average brains that were 11 years younger compared to folks who got less than two servings a day. Bro. Whoa. So that goes hand in hand, all right? So we've got uh, anything green. Chocolate is actually a great source of magnesium, very high in magnesium. But you don't want the, you know, the, right, the sugar, Hershey's, yeah. whatever, right. kiss my, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then not to say that you can't have it. That's the thing too. Like everything has its place, but that's not gonna, if you wanna get magnesium from chocolate or that experience, let's upgrade it. Let's get something higher quality. Um, different nuts and seeds, you know, hemp seeds are a great source of magnesium. You know, there's a whole different list. There's many different, it's kind of hard. It's so needed. Nature's yeah, yeah, made yeah. it very available. But one of the biggest, like you get stacked when you get those green leafy vegetables. So. And that's what you're after. Yeah, but yeah. So, so let me, let me first of all, say something to you, and this isn't just blowing smoke up your ass. You did this with Sleep Smarter and you've done it with Eat Smarter. You have a gift, my friend, of taking complex science and making it simple, understandable, and I'm even gonna use the words fun. You do that with the Model Health Show, when you do your documentaries, or when you go on a rant on a podcast. You do that here in your book too. And so I wanna encourage all of you watching this right now, I want you to buy two copies. One copy for yourself, one copy to give to a friend because no media, no government official, no food organization corporation is gonna tell you the facts that are in here in a simple, easy to understand way because everyone wants to kind of sell us on the idea that, look, you know, nutrition is complex, so just take your multivitamin and uh, you know eat the stuff that says high in fiber and you'll be good, but that fiber doesn't even get used in your body. And so if you really wanna understand science and have it broken down to you in an easy to understand and a fun way, the dude's done it right here, so get two copies. But w w with that said, going back to cognitive function, yeah. like high level of mental performance. As an entrepreneur, I see myself as an athlete. I, my, my sleep is scheduled. I sleep at the same time, wake up at the same time, seven days a week. My, my water, the thoughts that occupy my mind, the people I surround myself with, the food. What other, I don't know, I'm using the word hacks, yeah. tips. It's this is the, need the big one right here, what I'm gonna share. <clears throat> because like I said, it's still, if you're eating real food, you're gonna be, you're gonna get your magnesium, all right? This one right here is a game changer. Mm. And it's stacked on so many different levels. I, the first part of the book is dedicated to metabolism and teaching everybody the science around that, mm -hmm. how your metabolism actually works, nutrients that create the hormones that make the magic happen. But it's also a big player in your cognitive performance. Now, you've heard this before, but we're gonna take it to another level. All right, so the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition they were testing folks on cognitive performance and found that simply by increasing their intake of omega-3 DHA, specifically DHA and EPA, I'm gonna talk about the difference, DHA and EPA, getting those in specifically, led to improved memory, just within a matter of days. Mm. Improved memory, improved ability to, uh, to focus under stress. So that's one side, that sounds cool, okay, cool. Here's the other side, here's what happens when you don't get enough. And so these researchers took, and they did MRIs, they actually went and actually looked at the brain and found that the folks who had the lowest intake of DHA and EPA specifically had the highest rate of brain shrinkage. Ooh. All right, and this isn't like, it's cold outside and you know, you're maybe right. in your, like you're doing a cold plunge shrinkage. This is like permanently can mess you up shrinkage. And so, but here's the thing, it was, just 
the bar was 1.2 teaspoons a day, 1.2 teaspoon. Under that brain shrinkage, just 1.2 teaspoons can protect your brain from, go from atrophying, all right? So how do we do this? DHA and EPA. Now here's the, the bigger arching thing because there's different types of omega-3s, sure. as I mentioned. When I was in my clinical practice, when I first started, I was just telling people to get their omega-3s in. ALA is the plant form, and it does some cool stuff, but it's not what the brain uses. So when you say plant form, am I thinking flaxseed? Flaxseed, chia seeds, hemp seeds, these are all great. Gotcha. And they're, 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 they're cool, but and the, the body is so hungry for DHA, it can actually convert some ALA into DHA. Okay. But you, you can lose upwards of 90% in the conversion process. So for you to get the amount of DHA you need, you're gonna need to literally consume, clinically speaking, ass loads of chia seeds mm. every day. That's a like, clinical term, I know. Like yeah. yeah, I like that. This is how we do a it. Ass load. <laughs> Write that down. So, it's just not viable. And also you just need to, you might as well just put your office into a porta potty as well. Sure, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, because you're just <laughs> all day. Because <laughs> it gets that gel, you know? But it's not that those foods are not wonderful, but here's the difference with DHA and EPA. We have something, we have, the brain being the most powerful entity in the known universe that we know about, it doesn't come to the party without protection because it is incredibly delicate as well. Your brain is about the consistency of soft butter. Mm. It's very delicate. And to be the most powerful thing, but super delicate, it's kind of like Krang in the Ninja Turtles. He's yes, like yes. Some brain, but he's got this, he needs this metal body to protect yeah, him. Yeah, it's like yeah. super gushy. That was actually a really good uh, metaphor there. That was really <laughs> First good. First time I thought about yeah. it. So, There's a whole generation that has no idea what the <laughs> we're talking about because that was kind of more our era, but anyway. So the, we have, it's the only organ that's fully encased in hard, hard bone, right? Scott, well, we've got a built-in helmet, the cranium. But your brain is so sensitive and it's so important you also have an internal security system as well. It's called the blood-brain barrier. And I picture it like it's a toll booth on what's allowed to get into the brain. Only a, literally a couple dozen nutrients are actually allowed to get into your brain. You might eat all this stuff, but your brain has its own diet. We call it neuronutrition, all right? Mm. And I, I picture it as that this toll booth is Dwayne The Rock Johnson, clones of him sitting at all the different toll booths. Sure kicking unwanted nutrition, nu nutrients asses and, and toxins asses and taking names later kind of thing. But there's an express pass for DHA and EPA. Like they can just shuttle in Keep it coming. because yeah. of this. The fats on our bodies, the fat that we're quote trying to burn, those are storage fats. Your brain doesn't have storage fats. Those are called structural fats. If your brain was made of storage fats and during times of famine, effectively your brain <coughs> would eat itself, right? It's like homemade sure. zombie food. Right. So our brain is made of structural fats. DHA and EPA are used to create, to literally create the, the, the physical structure of your brain cells, the plasticity and something called transduction. So they, this makes them able to talk to each other. This is how important DHA and EPA are, okay? Mm. So when I'm saying we need to absolutely get this in our diet, I'm not just saying this. I didn't know it was this important when I went into this project. I knew it was important, but not this important. And so how do we do this? Plant sources, that's cool, but not for your brain. If you're taking a vegan or vegetarian approach, we have to address this. We evolved having food sources, animal sources of omega-3s, sure. of DHA and EPA. Now we can take, based on, and we can be successful on many different diet frameworks, but we don't wanna do something that hurts us to our detriment. So number one, most of the studies, 99.5% of the studies on DHA and EPA are done on fish oil, all right? It just, it works. And the data, it works. And I've got some really mind-blowing studies on fish oil effects. Food first though, where does the fish come from? The journal Neurology, this journal, one of the most prestigious, focused on cognitive health. The journal Neurology found that folks who eat just one seafood meal a week do in fact perform significantly better on cognitive skills tests than folks who get less, all right? Just one a week, all right? But if you're not doing the you know seafood thing, or if you just like don't like fish at all, like you can't even watch Aquaman, you know what I mean? If, if you're like that with fish, there's also eggs. There's also grass-fed beef. There's other sources. But now we move down the rung from fish oil to krill oil, right? Krill, mm -hmm. microscopic, shrimp, but when I say shrimp, that might put off if somebody's doing a vegan or vegetarian approach, 
It's microscopic shrimp. You'll probably kill more sentient organisms like licking the air. Sure. You know what I mean? Like a few times a day. But even still, just to respect our, our own ethics, if that doesn't fit into your, but by the way, that other 1% of studies on that, are, those include krill oil. It's shocking how, how effective krill oil is because it's, it's red. It's rich, rich in astaxanthin and it makes the omega-3s work even better. So krill oil, next level, full plant source. If you're, doing, if you're taking a vegan protocol and, you're not, and your ethics don't allow for you to get more of a food source, I want you, no matter what, get yourself an algae oil. <coughs> All right? Algae oil. Algae oil. Now, here's the issue, and this is a thing that's different from me. I'm not just gonna blow smoke up your ass. We don't have much clinical evidence of its effectiveness in placebo-controlled trials. Mm. But we do know that the DHA and EPA are there. So chances are they're probably gonna work well, all right? At, at what point on the rung or on the ladder does like omega-3, you know, the capsules come, come in? Or the, so were you suggesting yeah. like eat krill, like take krill oil by way of those capsules? Yeah, so food, food first. Yeah. So fish, um, fatty fish specifically, yeah. right? Fatty fish, cold water fish. Then we get into fish oil capsules, yeah. but that's a, that's a whole food extraction, sure. right? Krill oil is another whole food concentration, right? So you're not gonna go and just start like opening your gullet like a whale and scooping right. krill, you right. know? So you're gonna have to take the pills. Right. right. And you wanna just, of course, <clears throat> when it comes to these things, make sure you're sourcing good yeah. from folks who are trying to do things sustainably. Bro, I'm gonna ask you a question and, and to your beautiful brain, Sean, it's gonna be like, Oh, you got water right down there. Oh, dang. Yeah. I'm going to ask a question. <clears throat> and and <clears throat> to, your, to your beautiful brain, this question, it might sound um, like I'm a neophyte. But I remember hearing when the whole farm-raised fish came about that, like, yeah. man, you don't want to do that because they're feeding those fish. They're in tight quarters. And so they're feeding them antibiotics. And so you don't want to go down that route. Now I'm out at high-end restaurants. And it's almost like they're touting the fact that it's like, you know, farm raised. I'm like, what the f just happened? Like, right, I thought right. that was bad. Yeah. I don't want farm raised. I want like fresh caught. Yeah. Am I, did they change something in farm raised where it's okay now? Or, or is that just, am I being marketed to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it can be fed organic food, right? It can be, the I didn't fish know can that. be fed. But that doesn't mean that it's okay either, you know, because fish should be eating things fish catch naturally. Anytime you feed an animal, including us, that is not designed to eat, they get sick. Sure. And so, you know, a lot of these farm-raised fish, of course, they're, they're fed like GMO soy, all this, what, like whatever. Right. But then some people have better, you know, higher standards of feeding them organic fish food. But the real fish food is a fish being out in the ocean, actually doing its thing and being healthy. Right. You know what I mean? Doing so fish do. Sure. But now there, then we get into issues with sustainability and all. There's so many. This is a this is a nuanced thing. There's there's so much to consider. But what's best for us is wild food, for sure. There we ha might have to make some concessions. And th this is the thing too. We, we don't have to be perfect. If you're eating some farm raised salmon, and you know you're getting in, you know maybe taking some krill oil, you're drinking getting your, your, your hydration, you know, you're making sure you're getting plenty of magnesium through your leafy greens. You start stacking conditions where, like, it's okay. Gotcha. We don't have to be neurotic. Even the, the water we're drinking out of in the plastic bottle. There was a time I would have told myself, like, I probably drink my pee before I drink sure. out of a plastic bottle because of the BPA. And one of the studies I show, share in Eat Smarter really looked at the impact and the data exists, and it's crazy that BPA has on fertility for both men and women. It's gonna shock you. but. The thing is, when it, your body is always constantly choosing better than. Once you get a better source of something, whether that, that hydration is coming from your food, whether it's coming from another source of water, it's going to outplace the other stuff. Sure. You know, Got but, it. you know, the m number one thing is getting hydrated rather than having this huge, because I'm the guy, like I had huge conversations about the best types of water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in reality, in our world today, man, there's so much... They, there's so much to talk about, so much to debate about. We just need to do the overarching important things first. Most 90% of people here in the United States don't have those things remotely dialed in. So we're like preaching to the choir, debating about minutia. You know, we got a paleo versus a vegetarian protocol. We got, 
you know, keto protocol versus a, you know, carnivore protocol. We need to get our citizens eating real food, yeah, like first and there. foremost. Like, Amen. But so what, what I did was I wanted to create, and I, uh, these are all my friends. I love these guys, you know, from the person who made lectins, you know, the big thing, you know, the, the plant paradox, Dr. Gundry. I was just with him the other day. I love these guys. My mission was to create something that is a unifier, that takes the best, because I can see it. I can see it looking, because they'll get tunnel vision with their own framework. Yeah. It, we, it's a natural human tendency. I did this in my practice. I'm grateful I did it. If I was doing something, my clients were going to do it. But it got to a point where I realized it was like a revelation. I have to do what's best for this person. And this person, their ancestry hmm. might be from, you know, they might be Greek. So like, let's go, let's take a look at what, what are some of the food sources? You know, what, what happened when you got, like, when did you, I start digging and we find out what's best for you right now. And even that can change. That's what I want to give people the tools to do is to be able to adapt and change as they adapt and change. Sure. Because nobody in the history of humanity has a metabolism exactly like Bedros. Never. And will never in the future. Nobody. But the point is, you, next week, your metabolism will not be the same as today. Sure. It's different. It evolves. So health is fluid. It's dynamic. We need the tools to learn how to take care of ourselves. Diet frameworks are wonderful. But what I do is I, I give an overarching understanding of here's the things that make every one of these diets successful. Let's do these things. Here are the things that can hurt you no matter what diet you're doing. Let's really nail these things down and get our citizens healthier. Brilliant. So, again, you've, you cover it all in here. And what I love about you is you seek out knowledge and then you acid test the knowledge and then you feed it to us in a way that's understandable. You take the complex, like I said earlier, and you make it understandable, easy, and I dare say fun. Uh, eat smarter, guys and gals. Eat smarter. Get two copies, one for you, one for a friend you love and you want to see live longer and live happier. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. First, to find out what our gifts are, the people that we love that are close to us, what their gifts are, and then we've got to teach them how to use them appropriately so that Superman is a hero and not a villain.